Ja, hallo. Schönen guten Morgen. Hello, good morning everybody. Please come in for the closing event. So, good morning. After a busy night of dancing, welcome everyone to this closing event. Hello from me about the program. We're starting a bit late. That's fine, it's Sunday. We've done a lot in the last few days. There are a couple of very interesting speeches to come. We have Manon Aubry, who's sitting here at the front. She'll give us some input. Then Thomas Ofatoni. We will explain a bit more about who these people are later. Then we have some closing words. You can also have the chance to take the floor. Then that's it, I'm afraid, after this session. That's it for the ESU 2022. So, first of all, a lot of thank yous. Let's pass the floor to the organization team. Good morning. Here we are again. I hope you're in better shape than me right now. I don't know. So just sit back and uh, have a listen. Well, whew. that's been a pretty good event, I think. I'd like to use this opportunity to say thank you to the people who have been giving me lots of support the whole year in the job of getting this organized. So, could you come forward, please? All of the volunteers who've been working on this for a year. So, culture, Harold and Thomas. films, exhibitions and all that. I'll just call a few people forward. Frauke has a few little thank yous there. Then we'll have a round of applause when everybody's here. The helper coordinator. People who've been running around all this time. Tamara, Ralph and Andreas. The interpreters. We thank them yesterday. There's one person who's been organizing everything. That's Maria Vala. The cafeteria team. They've come up with some wonderful drinks and snacks and everything. Ruben organized that. The excursions for everyone who uh, wants to get out from here. Eva and Zondos. The technology, the equipment. In addition to the uh, main people, we had Ziggy and Marvin working on, as volunteers. So Ziggy, there's Ziggy. Then Attack Germany, we had four other people uh, doing internship. Francisca, Maxime, Angela, and Jutta. Right. Finally, it's been international. The International Preparation Group. I don't know who's still here. I'll just read out a few names. If you hear your name, please come forward. James, Christoph, Abby John, Alice Picard, Friedrich, Dirk Friedrich, Hugo Brown, Dolphic Gerod, Dominic Plihong, Marika, Helen, Isabeau, Andreas Fizan, Jana, Jean Robea, Vevain, Thomas Soplowski.
Oh, just give us a wave. That's great as well. I can see a few of you. Just give us a wave. That's it from me. I'll pass the floor to Frauke. Thank you very much. Christiana, please stay. Hugo, please. Two of you. One has been indefatigable. She worked so hard to make sure this takes place. Uh, Hugo Brown is an internationalist. Yeah, please, a round of applause. He's put in years pushing for another European summer university. Then we had the, the COVID pandemic. Then we saw we could do it. We've done it. So thank you so much, Hugo, for giving us that push. It's been a huge success. Thank you very much. He's the person in Attack Germany who always makes sure that we look further afield and stay in good touch with the European network. Thank you so much. There you are. And you all know Christiana. No one here I think has managed not to come in contact with her. We're sitting opposite and people always would put their head around the door and say, I'm looking for Christiana. Then it was things uh, like we have to lock a door or something big like they've just towed my car. I don't know where it is, that kind of thing. Then she spent two hours on the phone and she was speaking to like different offices to actually get hold of a car that's been towed. So she's had a she's been the anchor for the team. <laughs> then every morning you were bright as a daisy looking for the next problem to solve. So thanks so much, Christiana. So well earned, round of applause. So really she is here representing all the people in the office who've been working so much, people from head office as well. People have been working beyond their job descriptions really. They've been going the extra mile. So one moment, Christiana. So, this is a special thank you for her, if she could choose. Thank you very much, both of you. Thanks, Christiana and Frauke, for those thank yous. Now, I'd like to introduce our two key speakers. We've got Manon Aubry and Tommaso Fattori. Manon Aubry. One second. She's a French politician. Since 2019, she's been a member of the European Parliament, an MEP. Co-chair of the left group in the European Parliament. She is 
part of the NUPS group in France, Joint Perspective Left Movements for Democratic Europe. Thomas Fattori is a politician from Europe. He was one of the organizers of the first European Social Forum, also involved in the alternative war, uh, water forum, and also other key forums, including Florence 10 plus 10. So, Manon, please could you come forward and give us your contribution? Then you can ask questions. Thanks, everyone. Hi, hi to everybody. Um, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm going to speak half in English, half in French. Unfortunately, my German is not advanced enough. Uh, but yeah, thanks to the interpreters uh, to, to do the job, I'll start in English and, and speak there uh, then in, in, in French. Um, I've, been, I've been asked to talk about the connection between politics and social movements. And I should start from where actually I started. I've been, and I consider myself still as an activist nowadays. I've been working for years for NGOs. I've been working mostly in Africa on the human rights impact of uh, extractive industries. So I've seen a little bit of uh, extractive industries um, um, images there. And then I've been working uh, for Oxfam on tax justice and inequalities. At that time, I hated politics. And I still hate it. Yeah, so you would ask myself, well, then you're hating yourself. Well, sometimes I'm hating yourself. But the reason why I'm telling you, it's because back in 2019, when La France Insoumise came to me and said, well, do you want to lead the list for the European election? I was like, no way. No fucking way. And there I am, three years later, talking from the political side. The reason I'm telling you my story, it's because it raises a lot of questions on how do we change that fucking world? And how do we do it? Well, when they came to me, Yes, I said myself, no way. No way because I hate politics, it's violent, it's sexist. There's no young woman, there's no one that I can identify myself. And then I asked myself, well actually, that's the problem. That there's no one I can identify to in politics. And the second question I had to myself was like, okay, I'm working for Oxfam, I'm tracking tax dodgers, I'm campaigning, Am I not having more impact there than in politics? Well, it's true. But then I thought again, and I was thinking, well, actually, to change the life of people, we haven't found any other way than just one thing, changing policies. And to change policies, we need for sure strong social movements kicking the ass of politicians. But at some point, we need the right people pushing for the right button into the parliaments. That's how, from the small door, I entered, I entered that, that world that is still not mine, that I still hate, but that I still believe that we need that world to actually change things and change politics. And this is the reason why I'm here today, because I do think we need coordination, we need common push from social movements and from the political world. Of course, there's still two different words. And I'm not saying anyone here in the room, you should enter into politics. No, please, stay, stay as, a, as activists. We need you from the parliament. When we are on our own, you know, denouncing some of the um, worst free trade agreements, like the last one that they've just signed with New Zealand. I've seen CETA here. But like, they've, they have, at least 10 others um, in, in preparation at the European level. So sometimes we feel on our own, but we know that we're stronger when we have strong social movements outside of the parliament. And that's also a little bit of the story of um, the, the, the NUPS, I don't know how you pronounce it, a new coalition um, in, in France that have been built basically on how do we connect 
some of the left movement and some of the social movement. In France, as you may know, there have been quite a few social movements over the last few years. There have been the Yellow Vest, the climate movement is quite active. There's been a movement against the reform on pensions. There have been strong feminist movement. There's been a strong movement also against police violence. What we've done is just like stay where we are. When you're a political movement, of course, you should not take the leadership of those movements, but you should push it, you should protect it. And at the time of the Yellow, yellow Vest movement, no one within the uh, political spectrum, including in the left, but the France Insoumise were like, okay, we need to hear what they have to say. This movement is actually a movement for tax justice. What they were saying is actually the richest should pay more and the poorest should pay less. This is nothing else but a social movement that we should actually support. And that's how we build our campaign for the presidential election. You know, the presidential election, the campaign in France is very long. It lasted for a year and a half. We started, we were about 8% in the polls. As you may know, we ended 19% in, in uh, uh, total result. We did it without at any moment, any sort of, you know, compromission. At no time we were like, oh, you know, we should compromise, blah, 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 blah. No, we are radical and we're actually proud to be radical. And, and it's because we've been radical and clear on the proposals we've been making, because we've been hearing the social movements, because we've been building on the social movement, that actually we've managed to reach that point. And that's one of the lessons learned. I'm not saying we did perfectly. At the end of the day, we did not win, but we did made, make some progress. No one would have bet on us. No one would have thought that we were just like a few thousands of votes from reaching the second round. And the reason why we managed to do so, it's precisely because during the campaign, we, you know, we, we, we thought that, yes, those themes, we could bring them forward, we could talk about it, we should talk about, you know, we should defend Muslims when they are attacked by the far right. Um, we should as well, you know, have a strong radical climate and social message that should uh, go together. In other words, we should break those, you know, sometimes artificial barriers between what we call societal issues, like racism and this kind of feminist issues, and social issues. We should break barriers between social and climate issues because th those issues are interconnected. And it's because we managed to bring those together that we re reach uh, that point. The way we do consider politics as well is to be useful. To be useful is, you know, even at a time when there's no election, we've been doing a lot of concrete solidarity actions, um, like uh, food collection, especially during the COVID time, especially for youth people, for young people that lost their job during the COVID time. We've been organizing as well concrete campaigns for people to learn about their rights, what we're doing, including that summer, if we do that every summer, we have a sort of caravan that is going all across France, only in poor suburbs, you know, this banlieue that we have in France. I'm sure you have similar in Germany with these very high tolls where they park uh, poor people in very bad housing conditions. And those people usually l vote less uh, than, than others. And are considering even themselves as like half citizens. We do consider them as full citizens. And we've been working a lot outside of election to actually build on their rights, to go where no one else is going but some few associations. And we've been working greatly with those associations. So that's how we reached that point uh, with uh, the results in, in France. It's interesting to see where we do our best results. It's basically among you, young people, the youth, uh, where we do almost uh, 50%. Um, in poor suburbs, um, we usually do more than 50, but there are some areas where we do 70, 80%. It's also interesting to see that actually we can compete the far right. There's no like fatality 
of having the far right very strong among poor people. It's true to some extent in France, but Marine Le Pen and the far right should not be as high over the next couple of years. And the, the way we can, we can fight about it is actually to go there and say how you know, the far right is not doing anything for the poor people, is not doing anything for at, at social level, for example, they are against the increase of the minimum wage, which is the most basic social demand that you can make. But we have to make that fight. And there was some times ago, you know, in France, the Socialist Party, they had this theory from the Fondation Jean Jaurès, um, it's a foundation that's close to the Socialist Party in France, that they said, well, actually, the poor people, they don't vote. So why bothering talking about their issues? We are going to try to convince people in cities. You know, middle class people, they are the ones to vote. It's true, they vote more. But again, poor people are not half citizen. And I think that's one of the key issues as well for us and one of the lessons learned for the left in France is if those category of people are voting, then we can make a difference. And if we make the participation progress in the election, then we can make a difference. And that's how we managed to have that result in the presidential election, the 19%, and only then we could create the NUPS, Nouvelle Union Populaire, Écologique et Sociale. Now maybe it's time to switch to French so that there are a little bit of uh, French people uh, <laughs> listening. So for a German and English speaker, you can wear your headset or practice, practice your French. And thanks again for the interpreters. Et donc, c'est comme ça qu'on a... So that's the way that we set up the uh, NUPES, this new union for ecological and social, socialist issues. So we didn't just create it to win. We wanted to have a radical program. And this was important in the context of the presidential election. So you had the Greens and the Socialists and others. So we were heading backwards. The minimum salary had to be 1500 net. We wanted to disobey certain European rules, such as austerity. These were the key ideas. And that's the manifesto we put forward for our new popular organization, people's organization. We had a radical ambition. We had radical proposals to make. So that's, um, we set up this, the NUPES. It's a radical French alternative. And we participated in the elections uh, in June. So, so you had the France Insoumise, a relatively small group. I wasn't, but I started politics in 2019. I had never been a politician before then. The left-wing party. So then we had, so we increased our number of uh, MPs in France in June last year. So. We want to continue working together collectively, supporting social movements. So we set this up, this started this change. There's a well-known phrase by Schopenhauer. In the, initially, people think an idea is crazy. Attack knows this well, like attacks on transactions and so on. Then over 20, 30 years, it gets on the table. Initially, people thought it was crazy. Then they fight it. Then they fight the idea. And you know how hard people can fight ideas. Now it seems like a normal idea. Taxing people who've profited from the crisis. Even the UK, even the liberals over in Britain have then looked to impose a windfall tax on certain companies. People thought we were crazy radicals. Then little by little, it becomes normalized. The aim is to take power, but having strong social movements, independent social movements. What we've learned, it's like uh, the 
uh, Popular Front in, in 1936, we got um, paid holidays. It's a bit like the situation with the NUPES now. When we get wins in France, it's because social movements were active. They were mobilized. They were out on the streets. They were pushing forward. They were securing progress that was made politically. So when uh, groundbreaking French uh, so, uh, socialist groups come to power, there will be changes. They will need to see m uh, mobilization to s be able to hold people's feet to the fire. Don't betray us. We're going to stay on the streets. We're going to mobilize and keep mobilizing. And that's how we secure advances. So once we get into power, I think the political agenda in Europe gives us some opportunities for collaboration. For example, free trade agreements. They are set to increase in number over coming years. We could Im should impose windfall taxes. I put forward my first amendment in the European Parliament at the start of the COVID crisis. At the time, I think we had 45 votes. Even the Greens voted against. But then times change. Things change. Even the European Commission made the recommendation that maybe it would be good for states to find new methods to make sure that energy companies don't profit too much off the backs of citizens. It might even be feasible to tax them more. That was the European Commission uh, agreeing with our idea. There are some states like France that refuse to adopt this measure still. But there are some joint struggles. You start off on your own. But then you gather more supporters. We need social movements to mobilize. So thank you for helping us with, to continue our struggle hasta la victoria, until we reach victory. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manon Aubry. Now, we have time for a few questions. If people have questions, do please come to the front here to ask your questions. No questions. That was such a great speech. Thank you very much. So let's pass the floor. <laughs> Genau, überraschend jetzt schon. <laughs> yes, so it's now. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, allow me uh, to an off-topic digression, which is not actually an off-topic, but would like to thank you for these days we spent together. Um, after three years of pandemics and social distancing, uh, it was necessary some social closeness and some physical closeness. And uh, uh, it is also spaces like these that allow us to nurture and to reconstruct social bonds in an era of uh, social atomization. And the reconstruction of social bonds is a political act, indeed is a revolutionary act that has to do with uh, also with happiness. And uh, a true social change project must hold together um, environmental justice, social justice and happiness that is uh, the reconstruction of social bonds, that is cooperative relationships and not competitive relationships. Uh, the, these days, we have discussed a lot about the 
dark side of our time. Forgive me for the definition dark side, but I belong to the Star Wars generation. Uh, dark side, that is the destruction of nature by financial and extractivist capitalism. And the dark side is also the exploitation, is the job insecurity, is the denial of fundamental human rights all over the world. Um, and it, in, in a word, is the destruction of our own uh, lives. And we could call it in a, in a synthetic way, the multi-level war uh, unleashed by financial and extractivist capitalism. That is, of course, a military war in a strict sense in Ukraine, uh, but also in many forgotten parts of our planet from Palestine to Kurdistan, from Yemen to many areas of Africa. Uh, but it is also the war against the climate and against the environment. Uh, it is the, let's say, the, um, uh, the social war, the war of the rich against the poor, or, or class struggle. Uh, it is the patriarchal war against the women. And 20 years ago, uh, in, uh, in Porto Alegre, then in Genoa, then in the first European Social Forum in Florence, we were saying another word is possible. And of course, we are still saying another word is possible, another word is necessary. Uh, at, at that time, the richest 20% of the world population owned 80% of the uh, planetary wealth. Today, the situation uh, uh, has even worsened only, not the 20%, but the 8%, the richest 8% of the world population on not the 80, but I think 82 or 83 of the, uh, of the uh, planetary wealth. Uh, and uh, you know, the super rich people in, during the pandemics uh, have increased uh, according to Forbes, there are 650 more than in 2020. So in short, the polarization of wealth uh, has increased. And incidentally, I say that uh, a single journey into space by uh, Elon Musk of Jeff Bezos pollutes more than one billion people in their entire life. Second point, today we are still in the midst of a global pandemic. And uh, the pandemic is not the result of a chance. Uh, the spillover is a consequence of the destructions of, of ecosystems. Uh, moreover, we would have faced differently in the past years uh, these uh, uh, epidemics um, if we had not cut social and healthcare spending or and, and we have not implemented the privatization of the public health care system all, uh, all around the world and the, of the welfare in general. And we have fought uh, against uh, intellectual property and against the patenting of vaccines uh, and more generally against the patenting of um, life-saving medicines. Um, you remember maybe already 20 years ago, uh, we were alongside Nelson Mandela um, fighting for free access to medicines for the treatment of AIDS. And this is uh, exactly what we are doing now for, uh, I mean, for vaccines. Uh, third point of context, the war in Ukraine, in addition to causing deaths on the field, um, is plunging us into an economic and social crisis that is already having disastrous effect. It is the uh, war economy, um, the food crisis in Africa, uh, the high cost of living in our countries, which is, uh, uh, of course, uh, affecting in particular uh, the, the popular classes. We will see in the, in the next autumn. And last but not least, this war 
is taking us back 20 years, uh, even with respect to the now mythical ecological transition, which is another victim, uh, uh, um, war victims, uh, so to speak. So, but if it's true that the war is changing, it is also true that um, there are underlying elements that do not change. Um, an important Italian sociologist, uh, Luciano Gallino, um, has invented a brilliant definition uh, to describe our time. We live in the time, I quote, uh, of the um, class struggle after the class struggle. Uh, Gallino, I mean, ironically, meant uh, that in our post-ideological time, where the media, the mainstream media or the establishment tell the tale that we are all on the same boat. Uh, at the same time, in the meantime, the, the class of the so-called winners uh, continues the class struggles against uh, the class of the so-called losers. Of course, winners is a, a, is a term much appreciated by those who think that humanity uh, must inevitably divide itself into winners and losers, and we are <laughs> not among them. Uh, but, but likely, uh, there is not only the dark side of the present time. Uh, there is also the bright side. Always look at the bright side of life. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, as the Monty Python says at the end of the life of Brian. And the bright sides are the social movements. The bright sides uh, are the Fridays for Future, Sinsha Rebellion, and in general, the climate and uh, environmental justice movement, the peace movement, the women's movement, the commons movement, the indigenous movement, the labor movement. So, the, the least is long, likely, is long. And on the bright side, there are also the many alternative practices. Manon was um, uh, mentioning the, the, the food collecting during the pandemics. I, I mean, the small-scale peasant agriculture, the uh, renewable energy communities, um, the social and solidarity economy in Latin America and Africa in particular, uh, the commoning and, and the many practice of mutualism. So all these bright practices, uh, social movements, initiatives, in their diversity have a common ground and, and have a common purpose. So to overcome the destructive uh, um, exploitation of human beings on nature, and this is the, of course, the uh, environmental justice, and to overcome the exploitation of human beings on human beings. And it is the social justice, to be very sure. So, uh, and since uh, in this closing event, we are also called to discuss the, the future and the strategies, I think that in order to have an effective strategy, that is a strategy that allow us to win, because we have to win, because we can't uh, 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 afford to lose, uh, and we are running out of time, as the, uh, also the, the climate justice movement is uh, uh, reminding us every day. So in order to have an effective strategy, we have to understand and to investigate what our weaknesses are. I mean, our weaknesses as movements. It's not an easy task, but we have to do it. And um, to be very sure, I, I think our weakness does not lie in the analysis. Um, as we have seen well in these days, in the seminars, in the plenaries, uh, we have a correct analysis of the, of the economic model, of the uh, structural interweaving of the different dimensions of the crisis, environmental, health, social. And I don't think that our weakness is, not, um, is even uh, in the proposals on solutions. We have proposals and solutions. Uh, but le let's say so. Unfortunately, being right both in the analysis and in the alternative proposal is not enough. 
uh, having even the perfect solution to the climate crisis, to the social crisis, is not enough. Of course, we don't have the perfect solution, but we have a set of solutions that describe a paradigm, uh, a coherent paradigm. So being right is not enough to affect and to influence the course of the world. Being right is not enough to be effective. It's not enough to change things. It's not enough to change the power relations. And so uh, what is our weakness, uh, in short, is fragmentation. Uh, a geographical fragmentation. Here we are in a in an international meeting, and it is very wise. Uh, but unfortunately, as movements, of course, there are exceptions. Uh, but in recent years, we have mostly closed ourselves within national borders. And the second is a thematic fragmentation. Let me explain. Uh, the water movement, the water commons movement, fight against the privatization of water and public services. And the, uh, um, I don't know, Black Lives Matter uh, uh, fight against the racist discrimination. But there is no space now for stable relationships. Uh, for, there is, uh, I mean, uh, no a common agenda. Uh, nevertheless, if today we want to face the enemy, if we want to stand up uh, to the enemy in a world of global capital, and if we want to change power relations, then we must build the stable alliances. Uh, at least on a European scale. I know it's not enough, it's better at uh, the worldwide scale, but at least on a European scale, in order to have a common agenda. And uh, in recent years, too often, we run after an agenda imposed by others, imposed by media, imposed by the worst politicians, uh, and, and so on. But together, we can stop, uh, we can stop following uh, the agenda imposed by others and try to impose our themes. Hence, the proposal that uh, we are addressing you in this, uh, in this moment. I mean, after this university, wonderful university, uh, after the September climate strike called by Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, after other important events of, of the movement, let's meet in Florence from the 10th to the 13th of November, where together with uh, uh, the European networks and movements, we are organizing a four-day uh, meeting on the 20th anniversary of the first European Social Forum, but of course looking towards the future uh, and not celebrating, let's say, the past. Uh, the November meeting is just a small step, uh, humble step towards the desire, the creation of a stable reconnection between social movement across Europe. And the, the meeting will be divided in two parts. The first two days are dedicated to initiatives self-organized by networks and movements. And there are 30 meetings self-organized by individual organizations uh, that are already scheduled. And the last two days, that is the 12th and the 13th of November, are instead dedicated to a general assembly, a convergence assembly. And we would like to have a real discussion meeting. That is, not an assembly where activists talk about their uh, theme. I mean, where environmentalists talk about environment, pacifists talk about peace, and so on. Nor an assembly where each organization presents uh, uh, its campaign. The idea we would like to, uh, to ask uh, transversal questions, or if you prefer, intersectional questions, which so are questions on issues that concern everyone, with the aim of getting a real discussion, uh, which brings out the problematic notes that allow us to make a step forward together and to understand why we are not able, for example, to have a stable connection 
between us. Um, the, the first question, of course, we are still discussing in the preparatory meeting, but more or less the first uh, question is, where is Europe going? I mean, what is the role of Europe in a changing world? To be, to be very short, I take the, the uh, geopolitical frame no? uh, uh, and the war in Ukraine. The, the war, this war is only a piece of a more general uh, geopolitical confrontation. You know that a few weeks ago, the Chinese President Xi Jinping hosted a virtual summit of the BRICS countries I mean, Brazil, India, Russia, China, South Africa. Um, for what purpose? Uh, they said to plan a new global development uh, partnership. So a worldwide uh, hegemonic transition uh, from west to east is probably underway. You know that China and Russia are both creditor countries. Uh, and the Chinese project is uh, now to create a new international monetary order, uh, uh, diminishing or resizing the role of the dollar and of the euro. So, you know, this is an epochal game. Everything is changing. Globalization, as we have known it and as we have fought it, uh, has been hit by many crises, economic, health, uh, environmental, now the war. And and it is clear that now we are facing a process of, I don't know, deglobalization or maybe perhaps of selective re-globalization with a macro-regional uh, configuration. So, and again, what is the role of Europe uh, uh, in a changing world? What is our role of Europeans, of activists? The second question we would like to ask is how can we eliminate the breeding grounds uh, of advancing right. So how can we go from rancor and fear uh, to hope? And rancor and fear are breeding grounds for, for, for the right. So forgive me the, this um, word play uh, with, the, 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 with the word right, but the political right often advances uh, because it gives the wrong answers to right needs or to needs that are uh, right. First of all, the need of protection, of social protection, while the policies of a large part of the so-called center-left are perceived as policies that have left people exposed uh, to the storms of the neoliberal globalization, policies that, that have impoverished, that have uh, worsened people's lives. And, and for example, in Italy, that's very clear. The, the fact that xeno xenophobia is often stronger where there are no immigrants or where there are a few <laughs> immigrants uh, may seem paradoxical, uh, but just indicates one thing, that xenophobia is not the poisoned fruit of immigration, but is the, the fruit of the loneliness uh, in which million people have been left in the face of the storm of the globalization of capital, finance, and markets. Third and final question, I've already said about this, so very short, being right is not enough, so why are not we able to make an impact? How can we give strength to our ideas um, in this context of empty democracy? of, I don't know, post-democracy, if you prefer to, to quote uh, Colin Crouch. Um, how to affect the national and European political agenda? So our humble proposal is start with the, the connection. So to conclude, my time is, uh, is running out. I hope I've been able to explain the substance and the heart of uh, our proposal. We are trying to build, let's say, the preconditions for a future convergence that brings together all the bright sides uh, of the present time. Uh, of course, as a priority, we are trying to involve in the November meeting uh, the new generations, um, the movements of the East Europe, 
the movements of the southern shore of Mediterranean uh, area, and of course to give maximum prominence to, uh, to the actually existing uh, movements like the peace movement, the, uh, the, the environmental and climate justice movement, the women's movement, uh, the labor movement, and so on. Uh, the hope, the hope, our hope, is to leave Florence uh, perhaps with a permanent table and the constant relationships between the movements, also uh, 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 in view of a possible common agenda, uh, in order to uh, be able to win together, to go beyond fragmentation, which is weakening us, uh, keeping together social justice, environmental justice, and of course, happiness. See you in Florence, and thank you for your attention. Thanks. Vielen Dank. Thank you a lot. Are there any questions to Tommaso? Additions? Anyway, we can also continue. So I would hand over the stage, uh, the mic to Sonia. Thank you. Is there a question? And we wait. War doch keine Frage? Okay, das war einfach so. Aber danke, dass ihr alle gewartet Nein, okay. Keine, keine, eine Frage. Bitte einmal ans Saalmikro kommen. I speak in English. Because in Spanish, or in Spanish, I don't know. Okay, in English. Um, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I have learned a lot about uh, social movement and the relationship with the politic. Um, social movement, I mean movement for social justice, for environmental justice, for climate justice and feminist movement. But I would like to say you something that I think we forgot ecological justice. Ecological justice, from the ecological justice coming the right of nature. And in Spain, we have uh, had a very important social movement, also in COVID. Um, we had a big ecological disaster in Mar Menor, and then people come in and began a new social movement. We get more than 700,000 signatures. The law uh, asked for 500,000. We went, we went to the parliament, and we get that all the politics from the left, from the right, from the center, listen the new social movement that we are fighting for ecological justice. Because right of nature 
Come Cain from climate justice. Come Cain for environmental justice. Come Cain for social justice. These are paradigms very important from the last of um, uh, 20 millennium and the beginning of this millennium. But we must think that we must um, fight not only because the people, because um, right for the people, because uh, ecological, climate, ecology, climate justice is very important, but we are thinking that we need to protect the nature because it's good for human right. But I think that we must open our mind and think that we are living in this planet with another um, reality that they are no human, but they have right to, uh, to live. And then is the new thing that I didn't like go without tell you, thanks a lot, but we must think that is good social justice, climate justice, environmental justice, but ecological justice, but can be a new paradigm to fight for nature. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a, yeah, just a small uh, thing. I, I fully agree with you. What you call um, ecological justice, I call environmental justice, but it's the same concept. And I think that is one of the two legs of uh, a social change project. So we need all the three legs, because I think uh, social justice, environmental justice, or ecological justice, that include climate justice, uh, and uh, include, I mean, as a something bigger, so the environmental justice or ecological justice is something bigger than climate, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, I think uh, the social bonds, I mean, what I call happiness, but anyway, we can discuss about it. But um, uh, I just want to say a, a thing that um, the point is that also this anthropology, anthro uh, anthropo uh, anthropocentric point of view, we are not uh, uh, something that is out of nature. We are part of nature. And you know that everything is interconnected. So the environmental justice or ecological justice has to do with social justice. Because, for example, if you have to, to build something, you know, to, for the waste, uh, an incinerator or how you call it, you are going to build it in a poor neighbor, not in a rich neighbor. So everything is connected. And I think that... This is our aim, but I fully agree with you. This is one of the important things, one of the important elements that we should uh, take in account for a social change project. Thank you. Thank you. Is that indeed a question? We only wanted to accept questions and not additional speakers, so to say, since it's the last panel today. Okay, then, then not. Thanks for your understanding that we will continue now. So it's now up to us, Maria and me, to have a look back at this whole event because this wonderful and very inspiring event of the European Summer School of Social Movements is coming to an end. So you've been in total 650 people at times and especially and we are especially happy about the guests who came from outside Europe. In 11 forums, four plenaries, 
more than 80 workshops and open spaces and a lot of small groups. We got to know to each other, we discussed and we had a lot and a wonderful time together. And on the sidelines, there was a wonderful cultural program. I didn't dance myself yesterday, but I've seen a lot of them. There have been lectures, theater plays, cinema screenings. A lot of that was planned, but there was even some stuff that popped up spontaneously. And yesterday, there was the opportunity to go to the open co-pit in Garzweiler and to see the village of Lützerath. and to support the people who are living in that village with a political action. And I want to announce that on the 27th of August there will be a demonstration in Lützerath against the digging of... and they will need a lot of support. So it would be very helpful if you could come or could spread the word in the social media. So and now we really get to the concluding remarks and then afterwards you can speak amongst yourself or start your journey back home. So what I want to say personally, I really waited for, for this event to, be, to happen after these years of COVID. And again, this event could strengthen this understanding of what we need, which is global communication and interaction. So the solutions that we need have to be beyond borders and on a global scale. And for that we need the support of those who don't have the same opportunities of participation as, as we have currently here. So what I took from here is a lot of motivation And we would be delighted to see you sometime again, maybe the next volume of the ESU or whatever brings people together. We wish you good luck with all of that and now a good journey back home. <laughs>